There's only a few films that I would say have a perfect screenplay. Casablanca, The Godfather, Sunset Boulevard, Network, The Graduate, Back to the Future. Now there's a lot of elements and qualities a script must have in order to fall into this category. One you'll often hear people use to describe an excellent screenplay is tight. But what does that mean? It usually refers to a script that feels cohesive with connected threads running throughout the story. It's the writer showing consistency and commitment to the plot and themes by asking questions and then providing answers. It demonstrates that the writer isn't merely thinking from moment to moment, but instead understands the cohesive whole. And the most effective way to make the screenplay feel tight and cohesive with running threads throughout is through the use of setups and payoffs. And a film that utilizes this tool and deserves to be mentioned in the conversation of perfect screenplays is Paddington 2. A setup and payoff is exactly what you think it is. Introduce an object, or idea, or anything of value. You screw around with these tanks and they're gonna blow up! And then bring it back later in the story to prove its worth. <laughs> think about the clock tower in Back to the Future. Save the clock tower! In the beginning, there's a flyer about saving the clock tower, and a bit of history about how the clock tower was struck by lightning 30 years ago. And then later in the end, Marty uses that exact lightning strike to jump back to the present. <laughs> to express our vision scene by scene, we crack open the surface of our fictional reality and send the audience back to gain insight. These insights, therefore, must be shaped into setups and payoffs. To set up means to layer in knowledge. To pay off means to close the gap by delivering that knowledge to the audience. When the gap between expectation and result propels the audience back through the story seeking answers, it can only find them if the writer has prepared or planted these insights in the work. This concept of setups and payoffs stems from the famous Russian playwright Anton Chekhov, who had his own writing philosophy that's now referred to as Chekhov's Gun or Chekhov's Law, which states, if in Act 1 you have a pistol hanging on the wall, then it must fire in the last act. Though this example applies to a weapon, this principle can be applied to almost anything in the story. Get away from her, you bitch! Every element of a story should contribute to the story as a whole. When it's done correctly, you get a screenplay without an ounce of fat on it. Everything is used to help tell the story, to push it forward, to offer insight into characters and give them each their own emotional arcs. Did you see who they picked? They're practically giving their money away. You, you should talk, Aquaman. <laughs> what do you mean? Oh, I'm not. Setups and payoffs can also make the illogical seem logical. I am never going to see a merman. Ever. Dude, be thankful. Those things are terrifying. Without effective setups and payoffs, a film can become over-reliant on coincidences and deus ex machinas, which makes the film feel more random and inconsequential. Oh, come on! The audience is more likely to believe unusual and implausible events if they are set up earlier in the film. In story, unlike life, you can always go back and fix it. You can set up what may seem absurd and make it rational. Reasoning is secondary in post-creativity. Primary and preconditional to everything else is imagination. The willingness to think any crazy idea, to let images that may or may not make sense find their way to you. In an intuitive flash, you see the connection and realize that you can go back and make it make sense. Logic is child's play. Imagination takes you to the screen. Let's examine Paddington 2 and see how it utilizes setups and payoffs to create a script that feels cohesive and intentional. But first, let me thank the sponsor of this video, Bespoke Post. Dear Aunt Lucy, I haven't been able to buy that pop-up book for you yet, but I think I've found something that you'll love even more. Have you heard of Bespoke Post? They're a monthly membership club delivering a box of wonderful top-shelf goods from under-the-radar brands. 90% of the products come from small brands, which I know you love to support, and many of those companies are based in the United States. Every month, Bespoke Post will send you a box of awesome goods worth about $70. But don't worry, you'll only pay a fraction of that. And the boxes come in a wide variety of themes, 
like outdoor gear, barware, home and kitchen goods, clothing, and so many more items that would be useful for you at your home for retired bears. Plus, you'll get to preview your box before it's shipped, so you can make sure it's something you actually want. The kind folks at Bespoke Post were nice enough to send me a few boxes, like The Weekender, which contains a beautiful mason bag that will be perfect for when I come visit you in darkest Peru. They also sent me a box called Nightcap that has lots of goodies inside, like two whiskey glasses, leather coasters, a crossword puzzle book, and a reed diffuser that smells like blood oranges and herbs, which you know I love because it reminds me of marmalade. And lastly, they sent me the canteen box that has a hedgehog lunch bag, a lunch box that fits inside, and a utensil set. I know Uncle Pastuzo always liked to carry his sandwich and his hat, but this just makes a lot more sense. I've been telling everyone about Bespoke Post, and if you'd like to share the idea with your friends too, just tell them to go to bespokepost.com slash ETE20 and enter the code ETE20 at checkout in order to get 20% off their first box of awesome. They can also click the link in my video description. Just make sure they use my code ETE20 in order to get that special discount. Now I must be getting back to my video. I don't want to keep people waiting. Goodbye, Aunt Lucy, and thank you, Bespoke Post, for sponsoring this video. Here are all the setups that happen in Act 1, and try to keep up because they come at a rapid pace. Judy is starting a newspaper, but is looking for news. Jonathan is interested in steam trains, but doesn't want anyone to know since he thinks it's uncool. Henry used to be called Bullseye Brown, but is now going through a midlife crisis. Mary is looking for her own adventures, and so she is training to swim to France. Mrs. Bird shows Paddington the coin behind his ear. I wonder how that got in there. We meet the community of neighbors and how they've all bonded with Paddington. Thank you, Paddington. You're welcome. Paddington is excellent at making marmalade sandwiches. Miss Kitts is looking for love. Colonel Lancaster is lonely. The garbage man is training to learn the fastest travel routes. Paddington has made friends with a stray dog named Wolfie. We're introduced to the pop-up book and Paddington's goal to buy it for his aunt. Paddington accidentally shaves the head of the judge. Paddington eats a candy apple at the fair and sees how sticky it is. Mrs. Bird doesn't like Phoenix Buchanan because he never remembers her name. You live with Henry and Mary and the great Mrs. Now then. Paddington uses the extending ladder in the suitcase in order to clean windows. That's a lot of setups. And I'm sorry if I missed any, but I believe I covered most of the setups in Act 1. Now, not all of these setups wait until Act 3 for their payoff. Miss Kitts and Colonel Lancaster's romantic relationship comes to fruition after Paddington cleans the Colonel's window. Paddington's established relationship with Wolfie helps it make sense that he would ride him in order to chase down Phoenix Buchanan. And Paddington shaving the judge's head isn't the reason he went to jail, but it certainly didn't help him get out of his dire situation. And Paddington's skill at making excellent marmalade sandwiches helps him make fast friends inside the prison. The other setups have connected and intertwining threads that run throughout the entire film, all the way to Act 3. Now, it's important to differentiate between the two types of setups and payoffs. The first type revolves around objects. An object should not be highlighted in a scene unless you can prove its value. Its significance must be realized later in the film. It may not be obvious in the setup, but the audience will thank you when the payoff makes sense to the story. The coin behind Paddington's ear helps him make the call to the Brown family once he escapes from prison. The stickiness of the candy apples helps Paddington move across the top of the speeding train. And the extending ladder inside the briefcase almost helps Paddington escape from Phoenix Buchanan. Without the setups to these items, they would feel random and unearned. Again, setups and payoffs help make the illogical seem logical. The other type of setup and payoff revolves around character. Tying setups and payoffs around character arcs and character motivation is just another way to make the entire script feel cohesive. Not to be consumed by humans. Everything is working in tandem to tell a complete story that never feels random and doesn't have any fat on it. Judy's newspaper gives the Brown family a crucial clue in finding the pop-up book. Jonathan's love of trains helps him conduct the train that follows after Paddington and Phoenix. Henry fights his midlife crisis by becoming Bullseye Brown again and knocking Phoenix out. 
and Mary's swim training helps her save Paddington from drowning. The community of neighbors helps the Brown family in their quest to rescue Paddington. The garbage man uses his knowledge of streets and routes to help Paddington get to the train on time. I mean, it makes sense that setups and payoffs are tied to character arcs. Character arcs are introduced in the beginning, run the length of the film, and are reintroduced in the end, but in a different way. They reinforce growth and change in a character. One of the best examples of this in Paddington 2 comes from Knuckles McGinty. Knuckles, with a capital N. Even though his character isn't introduced until Act 2, his arc is one of the most dramatic and meaningful. He starts off as an angry loner who only looks out for himself. I don't do nothing for no one for nothing. But in the end, his hardened exterior is softened as he sacrifices his own well-being to save Paddington from drowning. It's difficult explaining any one detail in Paddington 2 in a vacuum. That's because everything in the film is interconnected, with threads extending throughout the length of the film, all flowing into each other and offering explanation, meaning, and resonance. That's the brilliance of Paddington 2, which is why it deserves to be in the conversation when talking about perfect screenplays. Hi everyone, thanks so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this video. I have to admit that I was one of those naive few that had never seen the Paddington movies until only a few weeks ago. And I burned through both of them, watched them both again, watched them with my kids, watched them with my wife. And it's just one of those perfect examples of you love something, it's on your mind, and you just gotta talk about it. So I really hope you enjoyed it. If you're not already, make sure you're subscribed to the channel and also make sure you click the bell below so that way you always know whenever a new Entertain the Elk video drops. Thank you to my patrons who continually support and just give out of the goodness of their hearts to help Entertain the Elk keep going and to make more videos. If you want to be a patron too, click the link below. It'll take you to my Patreon site where you can see all the exclusive rewards, behind the scenes content, and everything else that I have to offer as a thank you to you. Another great way to help my channel is to check out the sponsors that I'm working with. So again, go check out Bespoke Post. They really have great items, great boxes, and lots of fun, unique things to give your friends or family, especially with Mother's Day and Father's Day coming up. I know I'm always kind of having a hard time of finding something unique to give or always find myself giving the same gift over and over and over again. And so go check out Bespoke Post. They have lots of great ideas. And again, make sure you use my unique code so that way you get 20% off your first box. Thanks again, everyone, for watching, and I will see you all in the next video.